Kerala's students to the massive open online course on money and financial markets. In today's module, we are going to learn about the determination of money supply. In this module, we will examine money creation in a more general context. We will explore how the level of deposits and the amount of currency holdings are determined. And we will also try to examine how actions of the Reserve Bank, including the open market operations, affect the total stock of money in the economy. Now, to understand the money supply, we must understand the interaction between currency and demand deposits and how the RBI policy influences these two components of the money supply. The money supply is determined not only by the RBI, but also by the behavior of the households, those who hold the money, and also by the banks where money is generally held. Now, we come to certain definitions in this context. Now, the deposits that banks have received but have not loaned or lent out are called reserves. Let us consider a case where all deposits are held as reserves. That is, the banks have accepted the deposits, they have placed the money in reserve and left the money there until the depositor makes a withdrawal or writes a check against the balance. This system is called 100% reserve banking. So we find that in a 100% reserve banking system, all deposits are held in reserves and the banking system does not affect the supply of money in the economy. Next, we come to the concept of fractional reserve banking. As long as the amount of new deposits approximately equals the amount of withdrawals, a bank need not keep all its deposits in their reserve. So basically here, a point that needs to be noted is a reserve deposit ratio is the fraction of deposits that are kept in reserve. We also come to the concept of excess reserves, which are reserves above the reserve requirement. So whatever reserve requirement are there, above that if the banks keep reserves, it is termed as excess reserves. Now, the fractional reserve banking is basically a system under which the banks keep only a fraction of their deposits in reserve. So in the system of fractional reserve banking, basically we will see that the banks do create money. So let us now look at the process by which money is created. Assume that each bank maintains a reserve deposit ratio, which we call RR, small r, small r, reserve deposit ratio of 20%. And let us also assume that the initial deposit of the bank is, say, 1,000 rupees. Suppose in the economy there are three banks, Bank A, Bank B, and Bank C. Now, uh, let us introduce the banks. At first, let us assume that banks accept deposits only. They do not make any loans. So, the only purpose of the banks is to provide a safe place for the depositors to keep their money. That's the only function of the bank, if we assume that. So in this case, what happens? The bank's assets are 1,000 rupees, which it holds as reserves. 
and the bank's liabilities are also 1,000 rupees as it owes it to its depositors. The bank is not making any loans, I have already said, and so it is not going to earn any profit from its assets. And we assume that the bank only charges a small fee to cover its cost. So students, my question to you is, at this juncture, what should be the money supply in the economy? So I come to the answer to this question. Now before the creation of Bank A, the money supply was 1,000 rupees of currency. After creation of Bank A, the money supply is 1,000 rupees of deposits. Thus, a rupee which is deposited in a bank reduces currency in circulation by one rupee and in, on, on the other turn, it raises the deposit of the bank by one rupee. And so, in fact, the money supply remains the same in the economy. Now, as you can see in the next slide that we have shown here the balance sheet of Bank A. Here, there are, two there are basically two columns. One is that of the assets and the other is liabilities. So here, since 20% is a reserve deposit ratio, the reserves that are kept here is 200 because 1,000 rupees was the initial deposit. The liabilities under the liabilities is deposits, which is 1,000 rupees. And under the loans category, the bank has 800 rupees left to be lent while it has to keep 200 rupees as its reserves. Now, imagine that banks start to use some of these deposits to make loans. So as I have already said, the bank will keep some reserves on hand so that reserves are available whenever depositors want to make any withdrawal. And this is what is called, as I have already said before, the fractional reserve banking. That is a system under which banks keep only a fraction of their deposits as reserves. So we find here that Bank A keeps 200 rupees of the initial deposit of 1,000 rupees as reserves and lends out the remaining 800 rupees. It should be noted here that Bank A basically increases the supply of money in the economy by 800 rupees when it makes the loan. Before the loan is made, the supply of money is 1,000 rupees equaling the deposits in Bank A. After the loan is made, the money supply has now become in the economy 1,000 rupees plus 800 rupees which the bank has lent out, that is 1,800 rupees. And the depositor still has a demand deposit of 1,000 rupees, but now the borrower holds 800 rupees in currency. Thus, in a system of fractional reserve banking, banks do create money. If I say that money creation stops with bank A, then I will be wrong. Because if the borrower now decides to deposit 800 rupees in another bank, say bank B in the economy, uh, the process of money creation is going to continue. And in the next slide, what we see is the balance sheet of bank B. See in bank B's balance sheet that the assets and the liabilities have changed. Now in the reserves, we have 160 rupees as reserves and loans that can be given out by bank B is 640, while the deposits is 800. How did this come about? Because that person who had taken loan of 800 rupees from bank A have basically deposited that 800 rupees in bank B. So the 20% of 800 rupees basically is 160 rupees which is kept as reserves in bank B and while bank B can now lend out 640 rupees as loan to another person. So here we see that bank B receives 800 rupees in deposits, it keeps 20% or 160 rupees in reserve and lends out 640 rupees. 
So bank B again creates 640 rupees of money. If this 640 rupees of money is eventually deposited in another bank in the economy, say bank C, this bank again will keep 20% of 640 rupees as 128 rupees in reserve and loan out the remaining, that is 512 rupees, resulting in the balance sheet of bank C. So if we look at the balance sheet of bank C, we find that the reserves have fallen to 128 rupees because now it is 20% of the initial deposit in bank C, that is 20% of 640 rupees, which is 128 rupees. The remaining part, bank C also now can lend out to somebody, which is, ar which is around 512 rupees. And in this way, we find that the process of, we call it credit creation in the economy, continues. And this process goes on and on. So with each deposit and each loan in the economy, we find that more and more money is created in the economy. Now we can see that as this process goes on, does it create infinite amount of money? This is a question I think students, you might be having in your minds. No, it does not. Because although the process of money creation can continue forever, it does not create an infinite amount of money. Because mathematically, as you can see it in the slide that I have done for you, mathematically, the amount of money in the original was, in the original deposit was 1,000 rupees. So original deposit was 1,000 rupees. Bank A's lending was 1 minus the reserve deposit ratio into 1,000 rupees. Bank B's lending was 1 minus reserve deposit ratio to the power whole square into 1,000 rupees. And this continued. So the total money supply in the economy basically would be 1 plus 1 minus RR plus 1 minus RR whole square plus 1 minus RR whole cube till an infinite series into rupees 1,000. If you look at this series, it basically uh, shows a geometric progression series. And for geometric progression, we know the common ratio here is 1 minus RR. And so we find here the formula basically boils down to 1 by RR into 1,000 rupees. Here in this sum, small sum that we have done, the small example that we have taken, the reserve deposit ratio is basically 20%, uh, which is nothing but 0 0.2. So it is basically 1 by 0 0.2 into 1,000, which is 5,000 rupees. So here we find that due to 1,000 rupees of initial deposit in the economy, 5,000 rupees of money supply has been created. And this is called the credit creation process in the economy. Now, the primary difference between banks and other financial institutions is the ability of this banking system to create money. Financial markets have the important function of transferring the economy's resources from those households that wishes to save some of their income and firms that wishes to borrow to buy investment goods to be used in future production. So this process of transferring of funds from savers to borrowers is basically what we call financial intermediation. So we know that there are many financial intermediation mediators in the market in the market in the economy but it is only banks who have the legal authority to create assets. So they are the ones who can directly influence the money supply. So after understanding how money is basically created in the economy by banks, we now directly go into a very simple model of the money supply. So we have seen how banks create money. Now we will examine what determines this money supply. 
So we will present a very simple model of the money supply under the fractional reserve banking system. Now in this model, there are three exogenous variables. What are they? Number one, the monetary base. We call it B. What is monetary base? It is the total number of rupees which is held by the public as currency and total number of reserves held by the banks. So total number of currency held by the public, we call it C. Total number of reserves held by the bank, we call it R. And the whole, obviously you can understand, the whole of this monetary base is basically controlled by the RBI. The next that we have is, the next exogenous variable that we talk about is the reserve deposit ratio. What is the reserve deposit ratio or the RR? It is a fraction of deposits that banks hold in reserves. Fraction of deposits that banks hold in reserves, that is R by D. Reserves are R, deposits are D, so it is R by D. And this is basically determined by the business policies of the banks. And then we have the currency deposit ratio, the third exogenous variable, CR. It is the amount of currency C that people hold as a fraction of their holdings of demand deposits, D. Now, this is basically C by D. That is currency deposit ratio CR is basically C by D. Now, it basically reflects the preference of the households about the form of money they wish to hold. Now, in this slide, I have so shown a very simple calculation. So, whatever definitions I have given about uh, money supply and B, we have it here. So, money supply basically is currency plus demand deposits. B is currency plus reserves. So, solving for both M as a function of these three exogenous variables, that is B, RR, and CR, how do we proceed? We first divide M by B. So we get C plus D divided by C plus R. Then we basically divide the right hand side of the expression, both the top and the bottom expression of the right hand side by D. So what do we have? We have C by D plus 1 divided by C by D plus R by D. We have already defined C by D and R by D. C by D is nothing but the currency deposit ratio, small CR. And R by D is nothing but the reserve deposit ratio, which is small RR. So if we make the substitutions for the fractions, what do we get? We get M is equal to CR plus 1 divided by CR plus RR into capital B. What we see that the equation of the money supply or the formula of the money supply is basically equal to CR plus 1 divided by CR plus RR into the monetary base. Now, we see here that basically money supply is, is nothing but proportional to the monetary base. So this factor of proportionality is basically CR plus 1 divided by CR plus RR and this is denoted by small m and this is what we call the money multiplier. So previously we learned here in this module the credit creation multiplier and here we have the money multiplier. So money supply is equal to money multiplier M into B, that is the monetary base. So each rupee of the monetary base will basically produce small m rupees of money. Now we see that the monetary base has a multiplied effect on the money supply. So the monetary base is also called the high-powered money. So we find that uh, basically monetary base also has got another name because it has the capacity to create more, a multiplicand effect, and so it is called the high-powered money. I have taken a very simple numerical example to help uh, you to understand this. Now suppose in an economy we find that the monetary base is around 500 billion rupees. The reserve deposit ratio is 0 0.1 and the currency deposit ratio is 0 0.6 if I take this. So accordingly, what is my money multiplier? I've already said my money multiplier is CR plus 1 
divided by CR plus RR. So, CR here is 0 0.6, so numerator is 0 0.6 plus 1 divided by numerator, uh, denominator is CR plus RR that is 0 0.6 plus 0 0.1. So, if we solve this, it comes to 2.3. So, that means the money supply basically is nothing but 2.3 into the monetary base which was 500 billion rupees that is 1000 150 billion rupees. So, each rupee of the monetary base generates 2 rupees 30 paisa of money. So, the total money supply amounts to 1150 billion rupees in this case. So, the last section of my module deals with the impact of the exogenous variables on money supply. Now, we had three exogenous variables. We had the monetary base B, we had the reserve deposit ratio RR, we had the currency deposit ratio CR. Now, we find that the money supply M is basically proportional to the monetary base B. So, any increase in the monetary base is basically going to increase the money supply by the same percentage. So, it's just directly proportional, so we have a direct impact here. In the second case, the reserve deposit ratio, we find the lower the reserve deposit ratio, RR, the more loans banks will be able to make because they will now keep less reserves and they will have more money to lend out. So, they, they will be able to make more loans and if banks are able to make more loans, then they can create more money from every rupee of reserves that they have lent out. So, this becomes a very, very important uh, determinant of money supply. And my third and the most important point is the currency deposit ratio or CR. Now, the lower the currency deposit ratio implies that the public is holding fewer rupee of the monetary base in hand as currency and the banks are holding more base rupees in reserve. So, they and the more money the banks can create in this way. So, there is a decrease in the currency deposit ratio basically it raises the money multiplier and also the money supply in the economy. Now, uh, we see that the central bank of any country, in our case the RBI, they have a huge role in controlling the money supply. They have various uh, uh, options or various instruments to do that. One of the most important instruments that they make is the open market operations. They go about buying and selling of the government bonds by the RBI. Then also there is a change in the reserve requirements. Now, this is a very uh, least a frequently used instrument and any increase in the reserve requirement basically raises RR and lowers the money multiplier and hence the money supply. And there is also something called a discount rate. What is a discount rate? It is the interest rate the RBI charges when it makes loans to the banks. Now, if there is any change in the discount rate, so that means that the member banks basically if they can, if they don't meet the reserve requirements, that means suppose they have lent out more to the public, okay, they have lent out more and they have less in reserves and they have to maintain that reserves. So, what they do? They go to the RBI and they take loan from the RBI to meet this reserve requirement and at the rate at which they do that is a discount rate. Now, if any member bank do it, that means the lower the discount rate, the cheaper are the borrowed reserves and so the banks borrow more at the RBI's discount window. So, hence any reduction in the discount rate will raise the monetary base and the monetary supply in the economy.
So we have learned in this module the three most important exogenous variables that have an impact on the money supply that is basically the monetary base, the reserve deposit ratio that is RR and the currency deposit ratio CR has an impact on the money supply and affects it. And also here we also saw how the RBI with its various operations and instruments can control the money supply. Thank you.